Do you know who this is? It's filmmaker Ted V. Michaels. For more than 60 years, the larger-than-life showman of independent cinema has been the director and producer of over 30 movies and has been involved in at least 200 more. He writes, lights, directs, shoots, edits, produces, and promotes his films. In other words, movies are his life. Whether it be Astro Zombies, Corpse Grinders, Aliens, Satanic Cults, Powerful Women, Evil Villains, or Haunting Demons, they all spring from the wild world of Ted V. Michaels. Ted V. Michaels was born on April 29, 1929, just a few months before the great stock market crash. Early on, he had a passion for show business. Ted's family moved to Portland, Oregon when he was seven. By 15, Ted was doing professional magic, ventriloquism, acrobatics, and accordion solos. Ted was proudly known to audiences as Michaels the Magician. In 1948, he married Geneva, and they started performing as a husband and wife team on stage together. What really started me on the idea of making movies is when I was 12 years old, out of 300 boys in Portland, Oregon, I was selected by a scout to play a part in a movie that was starring Merle Oberon and uh, uh, William Powell. And it was at the start of the war, and uh, they were priming me, so to speak. I had to study uh, English novels, uh, uh, gosh, I can't think of Little Lord Fauntleroy, that is not it, but the Charles Dickens stuff, they had me doing all kinds of things and the movie kept getting delayed. And so I was having, you know, write up in the newspaper, I was selected out of 300 boys to be the son of William Powell and Merle Oberon. And uh, people in school, oh, congratulations. And people, uh, I'd see him in a store or something, oh, you're lucky, you're going to be in a movie and all that. And it never came off. Now, by the time I was 14 or 15, I had my own two-hour magic show. And so I thought, well, why don't I get somebody with a camera and film me doing my magic show, and, uh, and then I'll have my magic show on record. And I soon learned that if you put a camera out in the audience and shoot the proscenium, you can't even see the magician, let alone see the intricacies of his magic and so on. So then I realized you've got to get a camera on the stage, change the angles, get close-ups and so on. So that's when I really became intrigued. And I said, by golly, if I'm not going to be in front of a film, I'm going to produce movies, and if I want to be in them, I can put myself in them, and I'll direct them. Tommy? What? Well, we did a lot of shows, didn't we? We sure did. Yeah, we, we played all kinds of theaters. Yeah, good ones, too. Yeah, a lot of theaters, and uh, sometimes you cracked me up. I did? Yeah, you cracked me up, and I laughed so hard, you couldn't talk. Are you kidding? That's true. Yeah. Well, okay then. <laughs> anyway, uh, Tommy, what? Um, do you remember the story about the elephants? Elephants? Yeah, not elephants. 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 No. You can't say elephants? No, I can't say elephants. I can only say elephants. Oh, okay. You know what I saw one of those elephants doing? No. What was he doing? He was picking up straw with his tail. Elephant picking up straw with his tail? Yeah. And if I told you what he was doing with it, you'd never believe me. Oh, Tommy, you're too much. Ted and Geneva moved to Bend, Oregon to find some kind of film work in 1952. There wasn't any, so he brought his own form of Hollywood to the city of Bend. His family grew, and Ted made ten movies there, along with corporate and promotional films. In 1960, the enterprising young Ted relocated his wife and six children to Hollywood, bringing with him the raw footage of his first feature film, Strike Me Deadly. Hey, wait a minute. Keep your goggle eyes to yourself. Me 
Deadly, starring Gary Clark. The story of two young lovers on a summer vacation, lost in a whirl of romance, oblivious to the world around them, until they suddenly face the telescopic sight of a killer's rifle. Can strike me deadly, you know. We um, we were using that that waterway over a crevasse that was down about a hundred feet. Would you believe that two weeks after we were there, that huge that huge waterway collapsed down into the canyon. Down, <laughs> if it had collapsed when we were all running in it, we would have all died because it was straight down to nothing but rocks. Hollywood executives who saw Strike Me Deadly couldn't figure out how Ted was able to achieve these continuous shots of actor Gary Clark running for what seemed like miles. It's because Ted was one of the very first movie makers who shot mostly in live locations, using a bubble top van to transport camera and lights to be totally mobile. With a limited budget, Ted filmed actual firefighters during their training on how to put out forest fires and used the footage for the climax of Strike Me Deadly. Strike Me Deadly, a suspense-packed picture, an experience you won't want to miss. Light the cross, brothers. Shot in 1966 in the midst of the civil rights movement, the Black Klansman, a.k.a. I Cross the Color Line, stands as Ted V. Michael's boldest moment in cinema. Ted's film addressed the social ills of racial inequality while it was really happening. was in fact so real that in some cities the theaters were shot full of bullet holes by incensed moviegoers. No two films of Ted's are alike. Produced in 1968, Girl in Gold Boots is a cautionary tale concerning the pretty Michelle Casey as she attempts to dance her way to stardom while sidestepping the evils of show business, most notably drugs, alcohol, sex, and murder. You wouldn't believe it, but I can't do this now. Four years ago, and I was just as young and as fresh as you are right now. And see that Sam was steady as a rock. And I had a pretty mind. I had a pretty mind. Oh. Oh, God. With the small sum of $37,000 raised by Wayne Rogers, later known on TV as Trapper John M.D., and his partner Kenny Altos, Ted set out to make The Astro Zombies, starring Wendell Corey, John Carradine, and Tura Satana. Actor Peter Falk was originally cast in a cameo, but Ted cut his scenes because he felt he was a little too comedic in a serious role. Later in his career, television audiences knew Falk as the offbeat Detective Columbo. Terror stalks the streets as a scientist human transplantation experiment runs amok. The Astro Zombies. It is done, Francho. 
John Carradine and Wendell Corey star in one of the most frightening horror films ever made. The beautiful, voluptuous, deadly, vicious Satana, a woman who would stop at nothing to gain control over the astro zombies, whose creed was kill, kill, kill. Killing. Watch as the astro zombies attack with maniacal fury. Watch as a deadly weapon cuts a head in two. Watch as the blood flows and splatters the screen. Watch. The Astro Zombies, you will die a thousand deaths as you watch The Astro Zombies, starring Wendell Corey and John Carradine. I have to tell you the story, first of all, of how Ted and I uh, became acquainted. I was working as the Silver Slipper in Las Vegas, and I was dancing there. And this woman threw this humongous ashtray at me that was like a, a lead crystal ashtray. And Ted was sitting basically across the aisle from this woman who threw this. Well, he watched me, I, and in five steps I had her up against the wall. Because I was just so livid. I was about ready to take her head off. The security guard come up and, and start to grab me, and I told the security guard, don't touch me, and he did. So I sent him flying across the room. Who are you? Ted was, yeah, he watched all this, and he says, I've got to, he says, I've got to, he, he told me, he says, afterwards when we finally met, he says, I had to come home and write this movie for you. He says, because the look on your face was enough to scare anybody. He says, you were so beautiful, but you were so angry. <laughs> yes, and don't you forget it. Years and years ago, in the 60s, after her dancing at the uh, et cetera club, where uh, and she very fondly recalls her stripping days, she'd come to my editing room at the studio uh, on her way home, and this would be two and three in the morning, and I'd still be editing, and sometimes we'd have a bite to eat and and a sandwich or something that I had saved or or she brought, and we'd wrap for a while. But she was always a delight to work with, and on on camera, she was so easy to work with, always willing and wanting to please, do the lines the way I wanted them to delivered, uh, just a a real pleasure to have, and uh, and to work with. Who are you? Come on. Who are you? The original Astro Zombies basically was based on a, uh, like a female spy. And uh, I, that was something that was very easy because I have the, the look anyway, you know, uh, I, I just look like a spy. I said kill him! Don't you ever question my orders again. I don't know if you remember the comic strip called Terry and the Pirates years and years ago when I was a little kid. That's the dragon lady I had in mind when I wanted to make the Astro Zombies. And, uh, and Tura was the closest one uh, to come to that, providing I could take her out of the leathers and make her a sophisticated lady, a beautiful Oriental, which she was, and she had all these gorgeous costumes from her dancing and so on. So it worked out very well. but. I didn't want her, if she was going to be tough, it was going to be with a pistol in her hand or a cigarette like she burns the guy with a cigarette. Made her a little sadistic, uh, but made her a female that many males are intrigued with. He did let me do uh, certain things like when I, uh, when I shot the guy in the pool and I put my foot up on the, the diving board, it, it was just, it was just something that to me it was natural to do. 
you know, and because uh, I was being very nonchalant about everything, I was just going to kill him, you know. <laughs> After the success of the Astro Zombies, Ted V. Michaels returned to the horror genre with the Corpse Grinders. Do you know what this is? It's a corpse grinding machine, a diabolical contraption that turns human bones and flesh into screaming savage blood death. The Corpse Grinders is another campy film, but this one follows the exploits of two entrepreneurs who own a cat food company that substitutes bottom-of-the-barrel human beings for grade Z slaughterhouse floor scraps. Ever try and cheat me, Landau. The cops might be interested in knowing what you're doing with them bodies. You'll be hearing from me, and there'll be plenty of money for everybody. After the cats develop a taste for human flesh, they begin attacking their owners. Bloody goodness and goofiness ensue. Don't eat the cat food, it's made from people. When Arch Hall brought me the script at the studio, in my studio office, I glanced through it. It wasn't called Corpse Corners then, but he had a couple, three alternate names, and I was so tickled with what I read that I said, how much do you want for the script? And, and uh, he said $1,800. And I said, okay. And this was all within minutes. I just peeled through it, but I, you know, I speed read or whatever. And I said, okay, let's go over to my bank. So I took out a quick loan. He walked out with $1,800 bills. And it took me a while to put the movie together. No one's going to stop me, Bobby. No one's going to stop me. I'll get it all. The money, everything, because you're nothing. The lab gave me credit, and we put together this thing and didn't have any money to build a corpse grinding machine. So Gary Heacock was doing special effects. So he got a bicycle wheel and some parts and plywood, and, and he built a ramp. <laughs> and then he built, put the gauges on it and flashing lights and, and a little chute where you know, the person inside the thing could push out this uh, hamburger mixed with sawdust, called it a little more red, to come out as the person went through the slot. Um, the motion picture rating board wanted to give it an R. And uh, I called up after I heard it give it an R, and I said, it's a joke. And the man who answered the phone, he said, sir, grinding human cadavers into cat food is no joke. <laughs> and I said, you've got to be kidding me. So anyway, they wanted me to take out the grinding. Of the, I said, that's the whole movie. And I refused to take it all out. I left him just enough to make it a titillating thing to this day. <laughs> We did get away with it, Malty, we did. What could have been sweeter? We'd chop them up and ship them out in cans. And who would have thought would lead us on the road to riches? That added ingredient turned out to be a delicacy for felines. Cats become savage killers when they eat human flesh. Well, the sample wasn't really large enough to be definitive, but uh, yeah, it could be human. The fun didn't stop on screen. Ted V. Michaels pulled out all the stops and employed a barrage of promotional gimmicks in the style of master showman himself, William Castle. The Corpse Grinders was a runaway success that shocked critics and Hollywood moguls alike. But drive-in theater goers across the country simply could not get enough of Ted's latest movie. The gimmick on Corpse Grinders was the fact that we used uh, cadavers and then start, started using humans for cat food. But the real gimmick was the sales pitch. We did business with a campaign uh, by a triple bill that um, uh, we had put together and we called it the Final Dimension in Shock, where I put together the corpse grinders, the undertaker and his pals, and the embalmer. Theaters that had never played a triple bill said they wouldn't do it, and we said, that's okay, we, we, we have other theaters. Pacific, uh, Pacific uh, Theaters in L.A. and United Artists all said, no, we're not going to play any triple bill. And uh, <laughs> so we said, that's okay. So meanwhile, across the country, we're setting box office grosses that knock people over. We did more gross in one week in a, in a theater in uh, Kansas City that is bigger than the grosses I think that they've ever done since. And that was uh, with the Final Dimension in Shock. And uh, I think we hit something like $48,000 in one week when tickets were 50 cents, kids 25 cents, and carloads for a dollar if it was a drive-in. And we did that kind of business. Unheard of even this day. But the gimmicks were you had to sign a certificate to see the Final Dimension in Shock. 
you had to assure me, the producer of the movie, that you were of sound mind and good health and would not hold me responsible if you didn't survive the movie. I had a nurse in the lobby taking blood pressure. I had a, I don't know how many blood pressure kits I had that we would ship to theaters that were booking. Had an ambulance when we could, an ambulance out in front of the theater with flashing lights and of course everybody would want to know what that was, where they're playing the corpse grinders and, and the final dimension in shock and people that didn't survive got taken to the hospital in the ambulance. And then I put on a contest, whoever built the best corpse grinding machine, the first one, first prize was $300, second prize $200, third prize was 100 That's where the stories came out that the corpse grinding machine was made of cardboard. Never was it. But some of the theater managers didn't know how to make a corpse grinding machine, and they didn't have Gary Heacock's ability to make a prop like that, so they put something together made out of anything, black cloth and cardboard, whatever. But that caused a lot of interest. It got the um, theater manager is interested in promoting the movie, and when we played the Los Angeles area, we outgrossed everything that played. Everything. We did $190,000 with our multiple break in the first week in L.A., and nothing else came anywhere near that. The multi-jillion dollar movies, nothing. And remember, I had $1,700 when I started that movie. I just, I just want to touch you. Uh, I want to... Now, now, if I, if I, if I take my hand away, you won't scream, will you? You won't scream again? In 1972, Ted and Geneva got divorced. Ted had to find a new home. He was now seeing the fruits of his labor and had had several box office successes. In keeping with the old adage, a man's home is his castle, but taking it to extreme lengths, Ted's credo became, a man's castle is his home. Ted acquired the hundred-year-old Spar Castle in Glendale, California. He also got the space he needed in order to house his growing number of female companions, as many as seven at a time. For a lack of a better term, these women would eventually become Ted's castle ladies, and over the course of 10 years, 60 or more would pass through the castle's corridors. The corpse grinders and the blood orgy of the she-devils would be filmed inside its walls. Oh, here's a picture of my castle. It has 26 rooms, 8,000 square feet, uh, eight bedrooms on several acres with just bare land. But this film, this shot was shot almost 100 years ago. It's been improved a lot since, and even when I was there, I did a lot of improving, but that's it. Yeah, at the castle, it was after most of my family was on their way with their own personal lives. My daughters, too, were married already. And as far as the girls, you know, friends would come by with the girl, maybe they didn't have a job, really interested in making movies and wanting to learn. So we kept a very respectable thing. I had a number of ladies living with me, anywhere from four to seven at a time. Went on for 10 or 12 years, maybe a total of 60 girls. But if you ever see any of my other movies where one of them says, yes, Ted Michaels taught me how to make movies. You start with a pencil and you start writing. And another one, and of course, uh, I, I did have the girls involved in, in the help of making my movies. Uh, like Sherry Vernon did makeup, Doreen Ross did script supervision, um, uh, Franca did wardrobe, uh, gee, me, Christmas, one of the girls did um, all the social activities. In other words, she was uh, like the food caterer. And um, we were close knit. We had a nice, Jenny went on to make. Uh, a living in a lot of movies in New York and so on, based on what she learned from, from me, working on mine. So we lived like a big family. Uh, it was not a place where gentlemen could come to sit with pretty girls and ask them to go out and so on. We just didn't get involved in that at all. If they were living with me at the castle, we lived as a family. I did the shopping, the cooking for everybody. Sometimes there'd be 15, 18 people at the table. We always had a lot of guests that was wondering, always wondered what was going on there. You know, there was nothing funny going on. It was just a, an honorable way of, of caring for people that at that point in their life um, 
felt it was better to be there at the castle with me than be any place else. And we uh, made a lot of movies uh, involved this way. And the girls got other jobs from other movie companies based on the experience that they gained from me. That's kind of what it was all about. So. This is Mara, evil incarnate, high priestess to Satan, the queen of the black witches. <laughs> We had the previews of the film at Paramount Studios. I thought my daughter would love it because she was eight years old and she'd want to see her mom in a movie. And so we took my daughter, my son was too young to go, and she sat there watching that movie intently, of course with her hands over her eyes, and every once in a while she'd take them. <laughs> and after the, the movie, we wanted to take her home with us, and she wouldn't. She wouldn't even look at me. She turned away from me. She was so frightened. She would not come home with us. So I had to have her go home with my girlfriend. And even after that, for weeks after that, she was scared. Mommy was the witch. The witch. <laughs> So bloody important that you took me off to Mexico, son. I was in the air looking forward to it. Starflight 12, Sabrina, blasted right out of the air. When? Just now. Here comes the Doll Squad, an elite army of female assassins in a race against time and death to save the world from hideously diabolical mass destruction at the hands of a madman no one has ever seen. Sound like Charlie's Angels to you? Meet Sabrina Kincaid, the leader of the Doll Squad, played by red-headed, beautiful, Francine York. Just give you a little push like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 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 Oh, o
we're in the Jeep and we're driving out there. The doll squad's in there. To, it's toward the end of the picture. And she goes, big red bazooka. Oh, God, every time we said that line, it would be big red bazooka. And we go, <laughs> big red bazooka. <laughs> there is no way in hell you could put a bazooka uh, on a shoulder, particularly of a woman. I mean, bazookas are very heavy things, but obviously it wasn't a bazooka. It had nothing inside. But it, it's very funny. So when people look at that picture, I want them to look at that scene and sort of laugh like I did. We had a screening of the movie at 20th Century Fox. Aaron Spelling came, and I think he was a guest of uh, Tura. When we had the screening of it at 20th Century Fox, I invited Aaron Spelling to view the preview. Four years later, out comes Sabrina as leader of Charlie's Angels. Now the same storyline. So everybody that sees Doll Squad say, oh, oh, I'm looking at Charlie's Angels. They all say the same thing. I had an audition for Charlie's Angels with a director named Charlie Grauman. And uh, I went in and I read, and he said, that's a good reading. And he said, <laughs> he said, well, he said, you know, he said, um, <laughs> would you do a little something for me? Meaning, I think when everybody knows what that would mean. And I said, you know, I said, I've been in this business quite a while. I said, I've never had to do anything like that ever. And I am not going to do it now. And he looked at me and he said, well, you're not right for this part anyway. Well, obviously I didn't get the role, but uh, I don't think you could do that today. I mean, that's that's just the God's truth. I mean, I, I have never, never forgotten that. And then, of course, when they um, we, when they started doing the series, I thought, well, this looks like the Doll Squad. There they are. Here. Hey. Good. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Let me help you. Oh, thanks. I'm just I'm drinking it. Oh, Is this the rest of your party? You always sneak up on people like that, Captain? Forgive me, it's a bad habit. Uh, we were filming on the boat, and uh, all the girls were in bikinis, and we were we were supposed to be on vacation. And the captain of the boat got so engrossed in what we were doing that he wasn't paying attention to where he was going, and he ran into another sailboat while we were filming. So it was he wound up breaking, uh, I think, uh, the the mast off the other boat, off the sailboat. So I imagine that got a little expensive, but it was, it was just, you know, one of those type of things. And, and Ted told him, he says, well, you should have been paying attention to what you were doing. And the guy said, well, I got a little engrossed in something else, you know, but I mean, all of us girls were, you know, fairly well built. And <laughs> We, I guess he did, wasn't used to having that much around him. <laughs> Are you ready to go back to town now, Miss Kincaid? No, I think we'll stay on for a few days. Just take us wherever you think is pretty. That must be a nice way to live. You ladies uh, just go where the notion strikes you. Know, relax. Yeah, relaxing. Yes, it's a very nice life, Captain. He gets more scenes done in one day than I, I, I can imagine. If you're working for the big studios, I mean, forever they take. We did 15 scenes in Catalina in one day. And believe me, that was an awful lot and phenomenal. He did a phenomenal job. Hey, fellas. How'd you like something stronger than a groupie? Now, doesn't that feel mm. good? Hits the spot. It sure does. Oh, no. Drink a little more of that. Mm. One more swig. Good for you. Hey, how about that? Nice? I don't feel so good. Neither do I. Say, I got just the thing for you fellas in the truck. Just come on. About a date with my husband. Oh, well, what's you got that I ain't got? Mister, you really don't want to know. Ernie, leave her alone. I don't think she likes you much. What's this guy's name? 
My husband's name is Alec. Hmm, Alec. Well, what about this one over here? She's married, too. Hey, hon, could you come here for a minute? More coffee? When she tells me you're married. I don't believe it. Sure I am. Well, well, what's his name? Alec. You guys must be new around here. I'm married to Alex Joseph, and so is she. And the cook's married to Alec, and there's a bunch more of us at home. Drink up. Coffee's on Alec. In 1977, a theater owner named William Thrush hired Ted V. Michaels to make a movie about outspoken polygamous Alex Joseph. Joseph, over the course of many years, married 20 women. The movie starred the real Alex Joseph, a would-be actor, and his real-life wives. How much did the film Alex Joseph and His Wives influence Ted's life? One of the Indian girls uh, suggested that I um, have my own uh, wives, uh, a number of them. She thought I was a very nice person and the temperament uh, uh, such as would be acceptable to many wives. Well, I'd always heard, even when I was in high school, there were seven females for every male on earth. So all the way through high school, college, and my early years, I wanted my seven. And that's how come the magic seven number stuck with me when I had the castle. In 1979, director Ted V. Michaels aimed his camera at a myriad of subjects worthy of exploitation. Horror, science fiction, action, drama, spies. Just as I thought. And international intrigue. It seems our Dr. DeMarco has succeeded in creating a subservient zombie. This is something my government must have. But it was time for something new. So Ted, with the help of his castle ladies, dreamt up the film Ten Violent Women. Adapted from an original female prison story by James Gordon White, this movie became Ted's entry into the already popular women in prison drama. I am Miss Terry, and I'm in charge of this section. Now, I want you girls to know that I do not condemn your past mistakes. They were made out of a lack of guidance and love in your lives. It's my intention to see that you get the proper guidance and love that you miss. I make it a practice to personally take time from my schedule to help any of the girls whenever they need me, day or night. Especially at night. Let Kent and Summers fight. How did you know? But Miss Terry, shut up! Women in prison films were known for being rough, tough, and ugly. And Ted delivered the goods with the film Ten Violent Women. So now, that is the collection. How do you like them? I love them. Mm -hmm. I'll take them all. Oh, oh very good. <laughs> Fill it up. What? I'll give you about three hot seconds to put them all in the bag. All of it. Come on. Well, Come why, why are you doing this? This is very valuable jewelry. I, I, I designed most of this myself. You, they, but these are very valuable things, Miss. I, Faster. Okay, I... But these now are all my... Now, get you a skinny little ass in the back, and we'll get the good stuff. The girls and I at the no, castle no, were no. sitting around the big table trying to discuss what kind of a movie we wanted to make, and we had a part of a script that James Gordon White had done about women in prison. But I didn't like the idea of just starting with women in prison, so we concocted a story that leads to the girls getting thrown into prison. And uh, we made the girls go out and rob jewelry stores with water pistols. And after they rob the, the jewelry stores, they bring all this jewelry uh, to me as a fence to, for me to buy it. So I offered them bags of drugs and so on, and um, 
and they don't want to take them, so I pull out a gun and I say, you better leave those jewels and uh, get out of here while you're still healthy. You go screw, mister! I said that was my last offer. Maybe your boss would be glad to get this stuff back. Now look, Joan did Nazi didn't have anything to do with this. This was our deal. I told you so on the phone. Well, let's ask Joe. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why don't you girls leave that stuff where it is and get out of here while you're still healthy? And one of them hits me on the head with a bottle. go down and one of the girls gets shot and that angers and the one and, and um, she does me in with her heel uh, while the girls are running. She's kicking me to death, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> kind of felt insulted when they first said Grindhouse Films. I uh, wonder what were they calling Grindhouse Films anyway. So I did a little looking into it. I asked a few people who were using that terminology and what they were referring to is the theaters and the drive-ins that were grinding out picture after picture and uh, keeping them grinding all night long for people that attended them. And that's where the Grindhouse thing came from. It's not ever been a sound or a name that's appealed to me I mean, Grindhouse seems like it's a, a throwaway, like when they call movies that they love, independent movies, call them trash movies. I, I feel insulted because you put your blood, sweat, tears, life, money, everything. I've sold every house I've ever began to own, never have owned one, but I've sold every equity I ever had in a home to make a movie. To this day, I don't even own a fourth of my own home because I borrowed against it for the last movie. I'm into it for almost 100% of the value of the home right now just to keep on going and when people when you spend your life and spend 60 years of your life dedicating your every focus all through raising a family all through everything having bad years where you're eating chicken bones for in soup for feeding your family it's tough and then when somebody calls it trash I feel like I gotta beat them up I feel like I wanna punch them out and I almost felt that way about Grindhouse until I began to understand you aren't going to, you're not going to impede progress. If they want to call them trash movies, and then other people would say, oh, but don't be offended uh, because we call them trash. That means we love them. We love them. That's independent baloney. I still don't like any, anybody calling movies that are made with as much heart and soul as I put into making my movies and everybody else who does theirs to call them trash. I'm offended. I'm offended. I like to see that, that kind of dialogue leave disappear. Well, a lot of people say that uh, you should do a, a little bit of a, how we say, uh, a cameo in a movie, and so I always got talked into it. It was never my focus to be in any of my movies. <laughs> but in Blood Orgy, I do play a witch finder. And uh, I, I burn cherry at the stake. In Doll Squad, I'm the guy that fires the pistol <laughs> that shoots one of the girls. But the funny part about it is, I don't have a big head. And the helmet that, that I was wearing, every time I'd fire the blank, the, the helmet would fall down another inch on my head. <laughs> I must have all of the information. And Mark of the Astro Zombies, oh, I played a mad professor to our satanic comes in and kills me. <laughs> we always talked about doing a movie where, you know, I kill her, she kills me or something. So uh, I kill her, have her killed in the movie, and she kills me in the movie. <laughs> Uh, 
In uh, Corpse Grinders 2, I play a professor <laughs> who's studying cannibalism. <laughs> and of course, in Demon Haunt, in the uh, costume museum, I happen to be uh, a visitor or a tourist in there snapping uh, a still picture on a little digital camera of one of the figures. And I, I show the watch that I got from Mac. It's a beautiful pocket thing. That's the total extent of my appearance in Demon Haunt. Snapping a picture, looking at my watch, walking out of the scene. That's enough. You gotta expect it when you're on the move. In uh, Mission Kill Fast, I played a, a, a renegade, a bad guy, a, you might call a terrorist, and uh, Shanti, my lady of many years, been in all my movies for 20 years now. Uh, she played um, a renegade's uh, terrorist sitting next to me, but being a, a, a female and having a nice part in the movie, as a, an agent for the CIA, we couldn't show her, so we, we kind of camouflaged her, put her in a camo outfit, put a helmet over her head. <laughs> Ted found a new partner in making movies when he met Shanti, a.k.a. Wendy O. Altamura, a successful psychotherapist who co-produced and starred in Ted's Mission Kill Fans. Of course, in the last number of years, Shanti has been uh, very helpful with me in, in all of my movies. She's in... Uh, um, Mission Kill Fast as a, a female CIA uh, counter spy, that is a, a double agent infiltrating the ranks of the of the uh, terrorists and so on. But they do her in. She was. Um, um, choked in the dimension in fear. In Corpse Grinders 2, uh, she sees people doing bad things. Mark of the Astro Zombie, she plays uh, a psychic uh, and so on. So she's been very helpful in all of my movies in the last 20 years. Chantel. An agency in London requested my resume. Back to this hour of the night. When I first met Ted, I, I went into his home and realized that this man had just moved from a castle because uh, I think his castle had 28 rooms or more. And so what he'd done is moved the 28 rooms of furniture into a smaller home and so immediately you got the idea of being around Ted is to be around big huge castle furniture so he has castle knives <laughs> and uh, knights in shining armor all around and his models the, the the mannequins that had been in the movies and so what you've got is a man who's still living in the 16th century who's crossed over somehow uh, with us in our world today and brought all this stuff with him. And so being a psychotherapist, I start to wonder, what am I getting involved in here? It's a fantasy land. It's time, everyone! The 1980s ushered in a not-so-new fascination with war movies. This particular cycle was kick-started by Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, so it should come as no surprise that director Ted V. Michaels would want to make a war movie himself. Roll camera, Patrick. Three, two, one. <laughs> Mission Killfast unspools a plot which pits martial arts masters against terrorists in their attempt to acquire illegal arms and weapons. This was a very expensive movie by Ted's standards. I now give you the ultimate weapon. Hmm. Anyway, we're on the set of Mission Killfast and everybody's hungry because we're up in those mountains for hours and hours and hours. And so um, uh, Arnie, Arnie Bartz, who was looking after the food down at the bottom of the mountain, had brought some hamburger meat up. I don't know who paid for it, it's immaterial, but the hamburger meat's on the grill. 
And I see Ted pointing to himself. He says he paid for it. Okay, all that right then. That was a very then. expensive movie. All right. And so the hamburger meat is on the grill, and it's all cooking nice, and people are saying, wow, we're going to eat on the, today. We're actually going to eat. It's been provided. And so we're at the top of the mountain shooting a scene with the soldiers. And we had a particular place where one soldier was killing another, and they were cutting the throat. And it's very cold on that mountain, Mount Charleston. And so we started the knife with the blood in it, and the knife's not, it, the knife's moving, but the blood's not going with it because he's frozen. Everybody's hungry, everybody's wishing this scene was wrapped, and it's not, then the blood's not going. So Ted says, take the knife down and heat it on the grill. Okay, so that was done. The hamburgers had stage blood all over them. End of story. No food. Well, we had to wash it off. But Ted got his blood, and he got the job done, got this throat cut with the blood running for it. That's what it's like working with Ted. And he never gets hungry. And he really doesn't. And he still doesn't. He killed them. What are you talking about? The Major. He killed my friends. And then I was going to kill us. Through a series of inexplicable events, Ted found himself at the helm of Angel of Vengeance. This film, which would later be retitled War Cat, tells the story of a victim of multiple rapes who avenges herself by fighting her antagonists using their own weapons against them. She killed them! One by one, the hunters become the hunted. I've been waiting for you, mister. It's an explosive action adventure packed with vengeance. Hey! Nice car! Why don't you guys just take a hike? Hey! Man, my old partier. We just worked this up a little thirst, that's all. Why don't you guys just leave us alone? Here, take the beer. Just take all you need. Hi. Oh, it's right friendly of you, son. Brings us to another little problem. I, uh, don't suppose you got a few dollars you could loan me. Here, I don't want any trouble. Trouble? I don't want any trouble. You want any trouble? I don't want any trouble. Jamie? That's your name? Jamie? No oh, shit. Jamie? Yes. <laughs> says so right here on the driver's <laughs> license. Said, Jamie, yeah. My partner out here, we was watching you for a while and kind of wondering when the hell you gonna get around to poking the pretty young thing? Why don't you assholes just get the hell out of here? Why don't you just suck on this? What's a helpless little thing like you doing on a deserted highway like this? About a ride. Sure. Why not? The 1980s were very difficult for the independent filmmaker. After 24 years in Hollywood, Ted moved from the castle to Las Vegas in 1985. Ted opened TVM Studios in 1993. Well. All of my movies were 35 millimeter. I didn't, for years, didn't do anything else but 35 millimeter. And of course, it's very expensive. And it's tough, as you know, to raise money to make any movies. I've hawked everything I've ever owned to make movies, and I don't have anything else to hawk. So I switched to digital. <laughs> I think we can probably improve on some of the formulas that our uncles used. What do you think? Well, that was a lot of years ago. Don't you think people are going to remember what the main ingredient was? I'll tell you, if they wouldn't have went overboard and used light flesh in the cat food, nobody would have found out. 
I mean, after all, who cares about cadavers? I just read where some guy's digging them up in some old cemeteries, and we saw the plots. He's getting away with it. Corpse Grinding Machine was great. Uh, it's kind of funny, and I look at the movie, I haven't seen it in quite a while, but there was someone behind the machine pushing pushing stuff out. It looks like, actually looked like really ground up uh, people. I probably ground up about 50 people in the whole process. Um, I said a lot of uh, people came in just uh, just to get ground up. Uh, he had a lot of his grandchildren and ground up his grandchildren, a lot of Ted's family. Actually, a funny story, uh, one of the guys that uh, played the cadaver that I ground up, I saw him on Fear Factor and he won the $50,000 he won on Fear Factor and he was one of the guys that I ground up in the machine. That was kind of funny. Hey, we're about ready for that first batch. We're making good and rich. We want to get these sales started off with a bang. them dead bodies anyway. Now shut your mouth, Caleb. Ain't none of your business. I don't like it, Caleb. Leave them bodies where they are. We don't want anything to do with digging up dead bodies. Here's my friend Liz Renee. Liz was an author, actress, and Vegas showgirl who appeared in my film Desperate Living. Ted met Liz Renee in the 1960s when he did the cinematography for Day of the Nightmare. Renee appeared in two of Ted's films, The Corpse Grinders 2, where she got her chance to go through the old grinder, and Mark of the Astro Zombies. They were her last screen appearances. Sir, the coordinates are locked in. I might best serve by remaining here to assist our dying and leave the space and wait for our anticipated returning supplies. Nonsense. The backup assistance may be needed for our safe return to CETA. But I have not yet mastered the ability to alter my appearance as you and Felina have. But you have mastered the ability to fly this ship, and your expertise may be needed in case our mission fails. Prepare for liftoff. Hubach, your flight path must guide us through the blockade of Traxxas ships. Your expertise is already needed, Hubach. I actually just met Ted, really. It wasn't far into our friendship when he said, I think I'd like you to be uh, from space. Oh, I dreamed this up too. A cat woman from space. May I present my presence as a volunteer. I will fly from CETA to Earth, and I will work diligently to bring food back for our people. And Ted's there directing, of course, saying they need a little more hair. They need a little more pink. They need to be a little longer. And, you know, never worrying about there's a human under these ears. And we just get these ears to Ted's imagination. And then he says, now, how about you climb that tree, you know, put on a, a costume, some tights, a leotard, whatever, and climb that tree. Oh, yep, yeah, just get right on it, you know. So, uh, being limber, I'm up, up to the top of the tree, and they said, now, now we're going to see like you're going to jump on me or something. So he puts on his scotch hat. So that's the, the picture that's become a promotional picture, which I really had no other makeup on other than these ears. going to begin this demonstration with the order to kill to the subordinate. That's enough of this funny demonstration. Drop the sword. You, freeze! You guys, get the hell out of here. Sokar, kill it! <laughs> Mark of the Astro Zombies was, uh, even more interesting because we're talking to the head of John, of Dr. Zarkov or, or John Carradine, uh, the model of his head, and we're talking and it's talking back to us basically, supposedly, because it's, uh, it's been kept alive all those years. You have withheld important instructions from me. 
What makes you think I care to share my secrets with you, Dr. Mikasevich? I play my I play my sister in in the film. It was so funny because uh, everybody said, "Well, you do look like your sister." <laughs> I said, yeah, well, after all these years, I guess so. <laughs> um, Ted winds up with my heel in his throat. What's the matter, Mikasevich? Having trouble breathing? How about a little more ventilation? Ted V. Michael's latest creation is Demon Haunt. It's Ted's most ambitious project in over 10 years, and it features scores of computer-generated images. Ted was looking to do a new film, and I w have wanted to work with Ted or do some writing for Ted for a long time. And so I just asked him, I said, you know, can I have a shot at, at writing something for you? And he was, sure, absolutely, because that's Ted. You know, Ted wants to make sure that everybody gets a shot and anything he can do to help you out, he'll do it. And he was really excited about it. When he got it, he's like, oh, we can do CGI this and CGI that. I approached the uh, the character of Scotty. It was actually uh, a little different for me. Um, he was more of a goth character. He wore eye makeup. You're never gonna believe this. Listen to this. It reads, had this woman found at Point Pleasant. So to kind of start getting into that role, uh, I work as a part-time server at uh, Annabelle's restaurant, which is in Green Valley. So I started wearing eye makeup to work. And uh, you know, most people kind of look down on that. Actually, my tips were dramatically lower for the, the time period that where I make up. Dana, did you find anything yet? Yes. What? I just put ah. myself in somebody else's Thank shoes. Uh, playing a paraplegic it was definitely a challenge and having to get to uh, use a wheelchair and yeah, get thrown out of a wheelchair by a demon that wasn't really there. So it was definitely a challenge, but it would be definitely something I would do over again. On the set with Ted, I'll never forget when we were filming Demon Hunt. I was behind him, um, behind the camera, and the lights were falling. Weird stuff started happening, and he kept saying, who's there, or calling Mac or something. And next thing I know, he's looking through the camera lens, and he looks into the mirror, and it was like some sort of a face that was there. I'll never forget that. I mean, that affected me deeply. And uh, I really never believed in the supernatural. Uh, it was kind of like I had to see it to believe it. I've never experienced anything like that. Uh, I, I'm a believer now. <laughs> Leave this house now! In God's name be gone! And Demon On, I think, is taking, taking us beyond what we've done before in as much as it has a lot of CGI. And, uh, of course, as you know, that's very time-consuming. Um, the snake pit alone required 9,000 minutes to render 23 seconds of the snake pit in the opening of the movie. And 9,000 minutes is 150 hours or six and a half days. So <laughs> anyway, that's Demon Haunt, my current project. You got room for me? Professor Mycock, if we can make room for you, are you ready to leave Earth? Oh, absolutely. We go. Proceed to the phasing platform. We are prepared for liftoff. Professor Mycock, we are aware of your studies. However, we're not scheduled to return to Earth anytime soon. Well, that's fine by me. I've got a lot of research to do and a lot of time to do it. I'm ready. You, Bob. It is time to prepare for liftoff. So there it is. A man who's been in the independent movie-making trenches for over 60 years. 
Within his career, he is a man seemingly gone mad with a movie camera. But in reality, it is simply the wild world of Ted V. Michael.